The scripture reading today is found in uh, Matthew 21, 23 to 32. That's Matthew 21, 23 to 32. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't, we, why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you what authority I am doing these things. Gee, what, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the, which of the two did what his father wanted? The first they answered, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collector and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, Grandpa. <laughs> well, this week, uh, for the first time since last December, I went on a ride along with the Baltimore police uh, after Nancy was diagnosed. I just said there's certain things I just can't fit into the schedule, and that was one of them. And and I told Nancy a couple of times, I don't know if I'm cut out for this. And every time I tell her, she says, "But every time you come back, you're blessed, and you are a blessing." So I said, okay, I'm hanging in there. Um, I went, and it was interesting, because also my, by reading through the Bible this year, this week, I read through all 12 chapters of the book of Ecclesiastes. If you know that book, it's just about the hopelessness and trying to find sense in this life. The wisest man uh, that ever lived uh, other than Jesus on this earth, Solomon, just basically had to try to figure it out, and he couldn't. Just, just couldn't. Vanity of vanity, all is vanity. A vapor, trying to grab a hold of vapor. It doesn't work. Well, as I think about all the books of the Bible, there's so much to take in. But Ecclesiastes does a great job and gives us a conclusion of what is going on there. Um, and we, don't, we read it for our call to worship. Um, Ecclesiastes says, Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. When I read that by itself, uh oh, it seems like I gotta work my way to salvation. Is, is that what that's saying? No, it's not. Because then later in John 6, they, the people were talking to Jesus, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Well, today we're looking at the authority of Jesus. This is the last week of Jesus' life on earth before the cross. And uh, there's a number of times, uh, actually, this Matthew puts this right after Palm Sunday. Uh, it's probably day two. It probably was Monday, maybe Tuesday that this happened. I don't know. It's hard to always figure that out. But, but um, Jesus cursed the fig tree as a kind of a private sign that the children of Israel had been fruitless. They were not going to accept him, and they were going to be cursed. We've seen many ways that the Jewish people are still under that curse. But he's going to restore them. He is going to restore them. But until then, it's hard. Well, Jesus is challenged in today's passage. And then in two weeks, we'll see how they test them. It's like the debate's coming up. Everybody's talking about the debate. You know, get, get that gotcha question. They hit Jesus with a whole bunch of gotcha questions. Well, being the Son of God, not a problem. He had no problem answering each of their questions. And, and he turned it back on them. And, and so what we'll see today is the beginning of that. Matthew adds something in between. Matter of fact, right in the middle of the questioning of his authority 
and the testing of his, him, he talks of a parable, which we'll talk about next week, which is his invitation. He is always inviting us to come. No matter how well, how poorly he is treated, he is inviting us to come. And, and so that's the, the, the way we're, where we're going in the next couple of weeks. Um, he's going to give it to these guys in about four weeks. Uh, he's going to tell them what hypocrites they are in, in pretty strong language. But, but that, that's where we're going as we're going back into Matthew after our series on relationships. Um, my proposition this morning is John, Jesus displayed and claimed the authority of God. There are people that will tell you Jesus never claimed to be God. He never did. He's just a good teacher. His disciples have got his message all messed up. You read through the Gospels. He did it by his actions. He did it by his words. And today we're going to see how his words and actions uh, display his authority and claim the authority of the one who was sent by God. So we're going to look at that. Um, and uh, let me pray before we go any farther and look into God's word. Father, we, we just so thank you for the written word that has been given to us to teach us about the living word, Jesus Christ. Um, we, we see Jesus throughout the Bible, but most clearly in the Gospels. And we thank you for this interchange that he had, this exchange of the dialogue with the religious leaders, the chief priests and the elders. And I pray that we would just get a sense of where would we be? Where would we be if we were there watching Jesus? The miracles were done. The teaching was one with authority. Everybody acknowledged it was authoritative teaching. But would we really submit? Uh, help us to see that our hearts need to submit to you in all of your authority. Bless us now as we look at your word. Have mercy on me, a sinner, that nothing I ever say will hinder the message your spirit wants us to hear today. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The first thing we see is Jesus' authority is challenged. That's, Ed read that. Um, and I, I'm not going to read it again, but, but for understand why do we challenge authority? Um, have you ever seen the bumpers there? Question authority. And depending on who your personality, what does that mean? It means in their face, I'm going to, you know, I'm really going to go after them. But hopefully we can see there's a better way to do it. Um, the first thing I want you to see, it's pride that challenges authority. These priests and elders, they thought that they were all that. Jesus condemned them for the robes, the way they paraded themselves around like peacocks. Everybody looks up to us. We are the authority when it comes to spiritual matters. And Jesus shows up and he's teaching. And the people say, wow, his teaching is unlike any other. It's almost as if he wrote the scriptures. He did. And, and to see, so they're, they're feeling challenged. So they're trying to challenge Jesus. And they ask him, by what authority are you doing these things? Why are you teaching these things? To answer, Jesus would be submitting to their authority. And he's not going to do that. He doesn't submit to their authority. Instead, he challenges them to think, well, you tell me, John the Baptist, by what authority did he come? Was it earthly or heavenly? And as he asks them that question, they're caught in a gotcha question. If they say the wrong thing, the people won't like them. If they say the other thing, why did you believe him? And I'll say not only does pride challenge authority, rebellion challenges authority. They were challenged by John the Baptist to repent over and over and over again. But they were too strong in their rebellion against God's ways. I don't think his ways are. John the Baptist isn't teaching it, right? We know best. They were rebelling against the prophet of God. John the Baptist was clearly a prophet of God. So Jesus' authority is challenged, and generally when we think about authority being challenged, it's pride and it's rebellion. But the last thing I want to see here is wisdom humbly questions authority. It's not wrong to question authority. I grew up in a church that didn't teach the Bible. Some of the things they taught about the Bible really didn't sound right. My senior year in high school, you've heard me say this maybe, they put me on this, a search committee for the next pastor. And they hired a husband and wife team who had both been divorced and remarried. My parents' divorce had rocked that church. Another young couple followed my parents' uh, example. 
And I just wrote a letter that I thought was very respectful. They had voted me on to the committee, which is pretty heady for a high school kid. And I'm on the committee that's gonna pick the next pastor. Um, but then we didn't pick him by the time I went to college, so I wrote a letter after I heard their choice. And I said, is this the best fit? I tried to be respectful. The pastor wrote me a very nasty letter back and basically called me a big judgmental person and that I had no position for any divorced person. And I, my, my, my view of that has changed over the years because it's not the unpardonable sin. But the idea of the husband-wife team, there's just verses that I, I can't get through that because I want to be biblical, not Presbyterian or whatever the, the denomination would be. I want to do what the Bible has to say. So I tried to question authority in an appropriate manner. Doesn't mean they're always going to hear you. And, and that's what we see uh, in this first exchange with Jesus. Now, if I were Jesus after I said, well, then I'm not going to answer your question. I said, all right, oh, it's over. I have better things to do. He continues the conversation with them because Jesus' authority is gracious. He is willing to show grace to them, even though they're planning to kill him at this point. Not only kill him, they want to kill Lazarus, who Jesus raised from the dead, because he's a sign that Jesus really was something. This is what these guys are thinking. We're going to kill Jesus. We're going to kill any sense of what he has done. They did. I mean, they killed Jesus. They didn't get Lazarus, thankfully. Um, but Jesus is still, in all of his authority, is being gracious to them. So he tells them a story. He wants them to hear. He wants them to think. And the verse 28 is where that begins. He engages his enemies. He says, what do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, and, and read the story. Uh, you go work. And he said, no. But then later he did. Second son, yeah, I'll do it. And then he didn't. Jesus graciously engages his enemies. You feel like you have enemies? <laughs> You've had people that, that as you walk by, they're not happy with me. Can you find a way to graciously engage them? Jesus demonstrates it here because he has nothing to prove. All authority has been given to him. He didn't have to prove anything. He's going to engage them with his story. And, and when he says, he said, which of these did the work? Which of them did what the father wanted? And they say the first, I don't think so. They're both sinners. The one sin with their mouth, no, Dad, I'm not going to do that. Another sin with their actions. What was the difference? The one turned. The one changed his mind. Because it's easy to say, in my piety, I am going to follow the Lord this way. I'm going to do this. We are going to do this. And then never follow through. It's all words. But when you see the change of heart, when you see your heart submit to Jesus' authority. And that's what the picture here. So both of them are rebe rebelled, one in word and the other in their works. But then Jesus goes on. I'm always amazed as I think about what I'm preaching. And, and Marge picks songs and I pick some songs and, and send them to the accompanist and they tell me which ones they like. It always amazes me how God puts a service together. And I knew we, we were going to invite the Kalars here. This was the week they were coming. Did you notice who's going to enter into the, the kingdom ahead of the chief priests and the elders? The prostitutes. What a perfect day to be looking at that passage, to hear their work. And that's what Jesus is saying. And so uh, let me just read the middle of verse 31 through the beginning of 32 just to hear it again. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors, and everybody hates them, and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. Faith displayed in repentance is the key. I already prayed that in our men's discussion today. What brings us forgiveness? What brings us faith? But also the blood. In the Old Testament, the blood of sheep and goats that was constantly being offered. But now Jesus has died once for all. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. So we see the need for faith, and we see the need to repent and toward, turn toward God's way for salvation, not trying to save myself. 
I need to trust in what he has done. So Jesus graciously reaches out to all. He engages his enemies, but he reminds us, hey, I'm reaching out to the tax collectors and the prostitutes. I'm still reaching out to you, even though I know your mind is made up and you're determined to put me to death. I'm still reaching out to you because of his grace, his grace. And then the last part of verse 32 says, and even when you saw it, Jesus is telling them, you did not afterward change your minds and believe. What does Jesus see in his grace? He seeks a change of mind by faith. He seeks a change of mind by faith. Romans 12 begins with our call to submit, present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. And we do that right in the context of renewing our mind. Renewing our mind according to what he says, not what we think. Renewing our mind for what he promises, not what we hope for. We renew our mind and we are transformed <laughs> as we renew our mind. So Jesus is, it had the word heart there, but it wasn't in the passage, so I took it out. The heart is usually our mind, our emotions, and our will. It's a summary of who we are in our immaterial being. So think about that. Jesus' authority is gracious. We know that we're saved by faith, but we're saved by faith in his grace. Demonstrated through the blood, through his death on the cross, and his resurrection showing he has the power to bring us forgiveness. So we see Jesus' authority is challenged. He handles it well. Jesus' authority is gracious. He continues on with these guys. He's, they, they, they probably came in. Again, there's a little bit of a break in Matthew, but then there's going to be a series of those gotcha questions. We're going to talk about that in two weeks. But he's engaging. He's still giving them the time to see where they might fit into what he's offering, whether they might accept what he is offering. Well, the last thing I want you to see about Jesus' authority is in verses 33 through 46. And I'll give you the title. I'm going to read the whole parable. I'm going to read what he says here. And, and then I'll, I'll just give you the, the players in this, uh, in this uh, parable. Who are the people and who do they represent? But the, the statement is Jesus' authority is final. Jesus' authority is final. Oh, I've been trying to negotiate with Jesus a different way of doing things. Jesus' authority is final. I, I was thinking about that last week when we talked about the, the stages of grief and how you move with, from anger to try to, to, to bargain. And I think I get stuck in the bargain angry, the angry bargaining stage. And not to totally accept, it's not gonna change. You've gotta to learn to accept what is going on around you. Um, so Jesus' authority is final. That's kind of where we're going. Listen to the verses 33 through the end of the chapter, verse 46, as I read. Jesus said, hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it, built a tower, and then leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard, vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said that he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard, lent, let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables. 
they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. That's a pretty clear story when you think about it. But making sure we understand what it represents. God is the master. God the Father is the master. He is the creator of all. And he didn't just say, hey, go try to make some money, uh, find some binds. He set the whole thing up. Our master is the creator of this beautiful earth. And all we do is trounce on it. <laughs> you know, the different ways that we don't acknowledge that he's the creator. Um, he, he set them all up. I mean, I, we were over in, in Nazareth when we went over to the Holy Land. And, and they showed us a, a place in Nazareth where they had a, an example of what this would look like. I don't think they had the tower. The tower really shows it's there so they could be the Defend the thing they can see any trouble that's coming from afar off. There's just a it's 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 well set up. God created this earth in six days, and He took a rest, and He invites us into that rest to trust Him. Um, so God is the master. The children of Israel are the tenants. I was just listening on the way up here. They were talking. It's a religious show, and I kind of catch what they're talking about. There, there's a out. There's a group out there that wants to create a one religion between, and, and, and combine all of the religions that came out of Abraham. That would be the Jews and supposedly the Muslims. They're not really descendants of Ishmael, but they claim it. And then, of course, Jesus. Um, and so they want to put it all. And basically, they think all religions are alike, so let's just put them together and maybe everybody get along. There's just so many things wrong with that assumption. But, but the fact is that children of Israel have a high responsibility because they have been given the law and the promises and the prophets. They've been given so much. And when they rejected Jesus, he came into his own, they did not receive him. When they rejected Jesus, they incurred on them a, a, a rough judgment. Moses promised it in Deuteronomy. I'm going to keep sending you messengers. I'm going to keep sending them to you. And the more you, the more you don't listen to them, the greater the difficulties be. After these, these messages that I've already told you about, we're going to be talking about end times. Jesus talks about the tribulation uh, from the perspective of the Jews, not the perspective of the church. The church hasn't been revealed yet. Actually, it might be a little revelation. I will give this vineyard to someone else, to others who will bring forth the fruit. But, but this idea the children of Israel, God's not done with them. He loves them. Paul, who is a, a messenger to the Gentiles, his heart broke for his people, the Jews. He said, I, I would be willing to be accursed if my, if my Jewish family would, would come to know the Lord. So God is the master. The children of Israel are the tenants. The Old Testament prophets are the servants. God sent Old Testament prophets. Moses was considered a prophet. He gave the law. We see Samuel, who kind of got the, the uh, period of the kings started. He anointed Saul, and then anointed David, and he kind of the, the prophet that helped that. But then in the book of Kings, you see the two powerful prophets that came, Elijah and Elisha, who came with many miracles to say, okay, God, saying, I'm working through prophets now, guys. You should listen to them. They're clearly for me because of the miracles I'm, I'm showing you that showed me that they're my, they're my spokesman. And then I remember when I first decided to preach Isaiah, which is a pretty long book. I broke it up, I think. But I, I remember the first time, as I was in the middle of that study, every time there's a message of judgment, very soon there'll be a message of hope. There's going to come a time when there'll be no more hope. The rejection of Jesus will be final. But until then, you can accept it. You can respond to it. And then we've got the Jeremiah, which is even darker. Even darker. Still, there's hope throughout that. that book. Jeremiah wrote Lamentations, the great middle part of that book on weeping. Great is thy faithfulness. Your mercies are new every morning. If there's hope. As long as God's sending the messengers, there is hope. But these people, the children of Israel, they mistreated the prophets. We think Isaiah was saw in half, put him in an epilogue, and we saw him in half. They're just different ways that they mistreated the prophets. 
So Jesus is telling this story and he's calling. And of course, these guys probably thought, well, if we'd have been in charge, then we wouldn't have done that. They're in charge, supposedly, when the son was given. And they did. They put him to death. To, to think about how the Old Testament prophets are the servants of God. And, and I just want to ask you sometime today or this week, take a moment to think about all the people that were God's prophets to you. They don't have to be called a prophet. Who are the ones that told you the truth? Who are the ones that helped you? You know my story, my spiritual mom at Bible Club, my, my camp days, all the camp counselors and, and, and the uh, camp directors that I worked with. And then just going on from there, there are just many places, professors in college, uh, find good professors, not all of them had good advice. And then find good friends. We said that a couple weeks ago. The people you hang around, you become like them. So be wise in the friends that you choose. So take some time and praise God for the people that spoke truth in your life, that have called you together. But obviously the last part of the story, the main character, uh, of, of, our, of this parable. Jesus is the son. Jesus is the cornerstone of faith. We either reject him or we accept him. If we reject him, we will trip over him and hurt ourselves. And ultimately, that cornerstone will crush us if we choose to reject Jesus. There's no other way. There's no other way to find the glory of heaven to be with God forever. Oh, that's so limiting. No, it's not. Because everybody's invited. We'll see that next week in the parable of Jesus. I want to conclude then with a question. Are we willing to submit to Jesus' authority? I wrestle with it, but ultimately come down. Who am I, who am I kidding? I can't beat it. I can't. I want him to change the way he's doing things. I can't make him do that. I have to accept it. And it's, it goes so much better once I do. Once I say, okay, this is how it's going to be. And notice from these, this, these uh, three points, we are invited to humbly seek his wisdom in prayer. James says, anybody who lacks wisdom, come and ask him. You don't have to challenge his authority. Question him. He doesn't mind. He's not threatened by you, the things you talk to him in prayer. He's just happy you're talking. He loves you that much. He's so glad. And remember what he said about David, the failing father. What did he do? He prayed. God gave him the grace to pray. We are always invited to pray. Whatever prayer looks like to you. The way I prayed when I was coming out of my liberal church is totally different than the way I pray now. I don't know if it's any better. Because the prayer is more about him than it is about me. It's, it's connecting with him. <clears throat> so we are invited to humbly seek his wisdom in prayer. We are also called to receive his grace by faith. We need to remember and trust in all that Jesus has done for us and is continuing to do. I know he saved me. That's not a question. It's the, the, the as Pastor Bertram used to say, he's chipping away at everything that doesn't look like his son to me. And that chipping doesn't feel good sometimes. But he's doing it. And I need to, to receive his grace and by faith know that he's doing a good work as he's completing me in him. And then we are invited to build our lives around Jesus. We talked about the cornerstone a couple weeks ago in, in prayer meeting. <clears throat> I'm not a builder. Ed's a builder. He can do things I would never even attempt to do. But what's the cornerstone there for? You plant that stone and everything is measured and guided off that stone. Jesus is the cornerstone. Our salvation flows from Jesus, the cornerstone. And then our sanctification, our growth in him, our maturing in him, all of that comes by aligning ourselves to him. And I'm thankful that you came today. I think sometimes a lot of people in the midst of the, oh yeah, we have air conditioning. Maybe they're coming for the air conditioning. We come, I heard a guy, he's really into entering into God's rest. And he really emphasizes, I think, the, the practice of the Sabbath. And just remember when I taught about that a while back at the beginning of the year, the Sabbath 
command is not given in the New Testament. It's the only one of the Ten Commandments that's not repeated. The principle stands. We do need a Sabbath. But he was talking about comparing it to fine china. Fine china is what you get out for special occasions. And he made this statement. Sunday is the fine china of your week. You're taking the time to set it aside as something special. And I don't know if he meant to do it on purpose. He said, so that you can orient yourself to China, Orient, forget it. Um, we need to do that. We need to come and worship side by side. We need to sing his praises. We need to hear his word. But it doesn't stop here. Commit yourself to a daily time. Get yourself a devotional. Let yourself be aligned day by day with the word. You're lining up with that cornerstone. And I know I spend sometimes way too long building in a way that it does not line up. And it just has to come down. I gotta start that over again. And I hate repeated work. But we have to do it the way he wants us to do it. So are you willing to submit to Jesus' authority? I pray that you would see that. I'm gonna pray. Scott's gonna come lead the closing psalm, a very short kind of chorus that that is just telling us Jesus is Lord of all. Father, I thank you. I thank you for each one that made it a point to come here today. I thank you for the way you are in charge of your creation. And I ask that you would <clears throat> truly bless us to know that your authority is not to be feared. It's to be revered. That we trust you and know that you're a good God who's doing a good work. And even when it's hard, we continue to turn to you. Help us to be a son that says, yes, I will go and then go. We don't have to just use our words. We follow through on our actions, but it's more, more than our words and actions. It's our heart that you're looking for. Help us to see that starts with accepting Jesus as the only Savior of the world. And once we've accepted you as Savior, you send your spirit and you guide us so that we can continue to align ourselves with that cornerstone in our lives. Thank you, Father, for who you are and all that you will do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Turn in your hymnals to number 599. Let's stand as we sing.
now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen.